uh, introduce the council, uh, Councillor Robin Juvenville, Councillor Marilyn Petito Devaney, Councillor Eileen Duff, Councillor Prince Kennedy. Um, and I'm gonna read a, a letter from the governor into the record. Dear counselors, pursuant to the provisions of the Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 27, Section 4, I am pleased to nominate for reappointment Colette M. Santa as a member of the parole board to a term expiring March 8, 2027. I appreciate your consideration of this nominee. Resume is attached for your convenience. Sincerely, Charles D. Baker. Um, and with that, we'll open uh, Board member Santa, if you'd like to introduce who you have here, and then we can bring forward your first witness. With me today is a second from the parole board. Thank you for being here. Attorney Amy Walker. There will be my two speakers today. Um, also with me in support is Intersectional Parole Officer Tim Ford back there. Good morning. Good morning. Daughter Maria, but he's sitting behind me. Um, so, uh, if you'd like, we can have whoever you'd like to speak first uh, come forward. Yes. Like me to sit. Um, that seat would be fine. Is this someone's? Uh, that's fine. Good morning, counselors. Good morning. My name is Kevin Keefe, and I'm the executive director of the parole board. Thank you all uh, for allowing me a few moments this morning to speak on behalf of Santa. I've had the privilege of seeing Colette since she first came to the agency from the Massachusetts Department of Correction in March of 2016. At that time, I was the chief of services and worked closely with Colette. She immediately impressed me with a number of strengths, her intelligence, her dedication, her commitment, her compassion, her pride in her work. As the chief of the transitional services unit, she sought to improve the standards for her unit and for the agency as a whole. In 2017, she led an agency-wide effort for accreditation by the American Correctional Association, or ACA. In, in doing that work, she utilized a a teamwork approach within her staff and with other unit managers to ensure that all units participated in the accreditation efforts. While the ACA standards provide uh, a minimum for correctional authorities and paroling authorities, Colette's commitment goes far beyond that, and she is mission driven. Second chances, she believes in rehabilitation, and she believes in responsible reintegration. She has spent decades working in the corrections field. Uh, the transition to parole was a natural, natural one for her. Uh, we spoke about her last stop with the Department of Correction at the Northeast Correctional Center, also known as the Concord Farm, where she had the opportunity to assist people that were at the minimum and pre-release level of security. She took great uh, satisfaction and gratification in, in taking some part and some role in people transitioning into the community, finding work, and taking the final steps toward reentry and reunification. I was thrilled for Colette when she was first nominated for the board back in late 2017. I felt that she would bring a relative to the combination of skills, experiences, and characteristics to the work with the board. As this body well knows, the parole board enabling statute requires, in addition, that at least one member have experience in forensic psychology, that each member of the board have uh, be a graduate of a four-year accredited college or university and have at least five years of experience in at least one of the following, parole, probation, corrections, law, law enforcement, psychology, psychiatry, sociology, or social work. Let far exceeds the requirements in both education and experience. She has attained a bachelor's degree, her doctorate, a master's in public administration. She continued her educational efforts when she got on the board, attaining a certification in drug and alcohol counseling. She also significantly exceeds the experience and training, having, as I noted, 
work decades in the correction sphere and now over six years with the Poles. She brings language skills as our only Spanish speaking board member, as well as diversity. Her education skills and abilities lend themselves very well to a primary function for a board member, application of the statutory legal standard, a, find, a required finding by the board and making a release decision that if an individual is released with appropriate conditions and supervision, they will remain, they will live and remain at liberty without violating the law and that their release is not incompatible with the welfare of society. The application of that standard requires the ability to comprehend and give proper context to voluminous information, including correctional reports, law enforcement records, assessments, substance use, and mental health evaluations. Similar to a judge, a board member is not an expert in all areas. However, they must have the ability to understand and incorporate a lot of information and expert opinions in, in their decision-making process. Colette, based upon her extensive education, training, and experience has a superior ability to understand and apply the board's legal standard in each case. I've had the opportunity to observe her demeanor, particularly during life sentence hearings. She maintains a professional and reassuring disposition. I've seen her interrupt questioning during the hearing when she sees a witness struggling to check in with them and provide them with a moment to gather their thoughts, to rephrase a response, and or to consult with counsel, as well as to rephrase her question if needed. She's careful not to repeat areas of questioning that have already been asked and answered. She has the ability to look beyond what a person has done in the past, to see the person they are today and their potential for the future. This is a key trait for a board member or any staff person with the parole board. During her time as a board member, Colette has gone above and beyond to serve the agency and the Commonwealth. She's continued to coordinate the agency's ACA accreditation and reaccreditation. She was recently named an ACA commissioner. She has spent considerable time and effort working on special commissions, most recently the Commission on Structural Racism in the parole process. She does all of this while maintaining a significant volume of weekly parole hearings. I have no doubt if confirmed that Colette will continue to serve the agency and the Commonwealth at the highest level of commitment and with a progressive approach toward rehabilitation. I wholeheartedly endorse her candidacy for a second term with the parole board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to go around and give the counselors opportunity if they have any questions. Uh, Councilor Juvenville. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. So the parole board, so how are they doing on parole people? Uh, in, in my estimation, there's always, in, in, in all areas of work, there's always room for improvement, but I think the parole board um, applies the legal standard um, in, in each case. And I think in terms of, of what they've done, particularly since Colette has sat on the board, and, and I know a lot of focus is put on, on life sentence cases, I will say this, and, and there's been um, some controversy over the length of decisions, but I will tell you, looking at the statistics, which don't lie, uh, in the last four calendar years um, in which Colette has sat on the board, this board has decided more life sentence cases than any other board going back. And I looked at statistics back to 1990, the 80s. Uh, the statistics really don't separate out for life sentence, but they've decided a higher volume of life sentence cases in that time period, and they've given more positive votes than any other board in any four-year period by far in that history since 1990. Uh, so I, I think, you know, there's ebb and flow year to year in terms of percentages, um, and, I, and I don't know that it's a litmus test for the percentage that they should parole in a given year, but I think this board takes its obligation seriously and does apply that legal standard in each and every case. How about parole in non-life cases? I think that fluctuates. Uh, our, our 2021 report is in final vetting, so um, I'm hoping in the, in the not too distant future that that will be out. But I think, um, I think the board was above 60% in terms of its overall paroling rate. It tends to be that the House of Correction paroling rate is higher than the than the state uh, rate. Um, as you know, those, those state cases involve some more serious um, 
serious offenses and serious histories in terms of adjustment in the institution and so forth. So typically the rate is lower for the state cases, but uh, overall, I think I think that's going to show plus 60 and it's fluctuated, you know, within the 50s and 60s. But usually they get positive votes in the majority cases. On some occasions, the state cases, it'll it'll fluctuate a little bit below 50 percent in some years. Um, those life sentence cases I, I spoke about, I believe um, 2020 was 49 percent. Uh, the 21, 21 final figures are, are, are coming in, but I think you're going to have a some similar rate uh, with that. Uh, and and if you look historically, the, the you know the annual reports are are a public record either on our website or in the state archives. Um, you'll see the trend has been um, you know you've seen in the, in the 90s. Uh, I think the percentages were in the teens as far as um, positive. Uh, positive votes. In fact, if you look at the total number of positive votes for life sentence cases in the 90s, um, I think the last um, two years alone, the board's exceeded that uh, in terms of the number of positive votes. So I think you have a board that's willing um, to to give people due consideration. Um, not that they're out, and I, I don't, um, I, I do acknowledge there's plenty of work for us to do, uh, plenty of areas of improvement for us to make. But uh, Colette, since Colette has been on this board, um, and it's not only her, you know, there's other, there's other members, um, and, and all criticisms aside, they deal with a higher volume than any other board member has historically uh, in terms of those most complicated cases. Uh, the volume of the other cases has gone down, um, and, and fortunately the prison population has gone down as I think, you know, um, some of the criminal justice reforms have taken hold and CSG, more work to done on that. We're only at the beginning of that, I think. But, um, I think there's more to do in terms of diverting people from prison and diverting people in, in terms of revocations as well. Um, what's, the, uh, what's the issue with the decisions? There's, there's a number of factors that go into the decisions. Um, as you know, they're very complex cases. Getting them out to the, you know, yeah. decided it. Getting them out. So, uh, you know, initially after, after a hearing is held, there's a two week period during which the administrative record is kept open. In some cases, attorneys will ask for additional time. In some cases, the board is looking for additional information. Um, there, there's a deliberation process within the board. And then there's final vetting with the, um, with the general counsel's office and um, there's been quite a bit of litigation over the years so there, there's got to be uh, some level of certainty that the that the, the final decision that legal standard and, um, and and so that we're not dealing with um, you know unnecessary uh, litigation that the boards kept to their legal standard in each and every case is there a rule or regulation about the amount of time you should have a decision on there isn't presently. I know there's there's um, pending legislation and recommendations uh, anywhere from 60 days. I think presently uh, we're going through a retooling process within general counsel's office. We've um, got some additional administrative report uh, support, and uh, we've I think in the last month they've issued at least um, in excess of 20. 20 decisions. I think over the next several months, they're going to be able to get that window down. I don't, you know, in terms of what that magic number is, 60 or 90 days, I think it's difficult, particularly in the more complex cases where you, where there's additional information to review or where you have as many as two binders that thick that the board's got to go through and, and, and deliberate in addition to the hearing, um, the hearing uh, record itself. Um, so I, in, you know, additional materials that are submitted after the hearing. So, but I think we'll be able to get more towards that um, 90 day period as we progress over the next several months. And I know that's been problematic uh, over, over time and an ebb and flow as far as how long the decisions uh, take. But um, it, it is an area that uh, we continue to be working with prospects of improving that over the next several months. So would it be better, in your opinion, to have a 90-day rule, 90-day law? Uh, I, I'm not certain. I, I would think there would need to be some um, some exceptions or some leeway in there for cases in which additional information is either 
uh, going to be submitted by attorneys or the board needs an additional uh, information. So there would need to be a, some flexibility, but I think in a case where everything's on the record, um, I, I, I think if there were um, a regulation, I would, I, I would think that uh, that would be, the board would be able to. And uh, this nominee, uh, what is her voting record in your opinion? I believe that she has, and I don't have statistics for individual board members in front of me, but I think she's um, she has always um, been amongst the highest in terms of um, giving people uh, a positive vote. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Um, Councilor Devaney. Yeah. Any questions for the witness? No. I'm sorry. No. Can I get the same thing? Okay. Do you have any questions for the witness? Questions, Marilyn. You can go before me. Usually, you raise your hand to ask. I didn't raise my hand. Okay. okay. Sure. Okay. Councilor Duff. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here today. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm curious because there's been a lot of talk about this ACA, um, which. I know a lot about um, it, it's not really an accreditation that has a lot of prestige to it, and it has really nothing to do with the board. No other chair in the history, and this is not a political thing, has ever applied for this and has made decisions, financial decisions, to not apply for it. Um, but if, if this administration decided to, why, with all the legal staff they have, would they send a board member? Been down a board member. She's missed almost 17% of the work here going to these meetings. I mean, that, that, it, it just seems to me like a very, and, and do you approve this? As I, I, I don't think she's missed 17% of hearings to the ACA. And I'm not going to argue that with you, but are you the one that appeared yeah, and, and, this? And I, I don't want to argue um, in terms of missed hearings, but in terms of that due to ACA obligation, I don't think uh, missing hearings uh, is related necessarily to that. It's very few. She goes to uh, two conferences per year for that. So she only misses two days a year? Due to that, due to that all, ACA. All, all board members, as you know, have vacation per month. No, I understand that. I'm not talking that, about that at all. That, yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. But are you the one that approved this ACA? Absolutely. Why? I'm just curious, with, with such, um, although this board has a plethora of resources no other board has ever had, why on earth, when you have been down member of the board for so long, and there's been holdovers and holdovers and holdovers, why would you send a board member to this and not one of the multiple legal staff you have? It, it, her attendance at these conferences has not affected not the, impacted the ability to do. It's not my question. Uh, my que that's not the question is about her. My question is to you, why would you make that choice? Why would you when when you're short staffed already with board? Why would you take a board member off of hearings? Well, I think when you're talking about um, trying to establish standards for an agency, you have to have a, at least a floor. Um, and, and I don't, whether we had ACA accreditation or not, I think that's, that's, that's the floor. There's a lot more work to be done. I, I agree with you that that's not, um, that's not the be all and all have that accreditation, but that's, that's a floor, that's a minimum. And then there's more that, um, I think that we have to do, uh, as an, as an agency. So, uh, I appreciate all her efforts in that regard, but I would agree with you that that's, that's just the minimum. I think Colette would have <laughs> Well, I understand that, sir, and and I understand that that she's only missed two meetings a year because of this. Um, what I don't understand why you, as the director, short staff, take a, such a you told us how valuable she is. Why on earth would you that instead of one of the lawyers? Because we'd already met. The, the, the floor had already been met previously. It collapsed under Chairman Tressler. We, we know that to be true. That has been validated to me from this administration that he essentially, I mean, he told us in his hearing 
in four plus years, he only ever looked at one parole app, at one um, pardon application. I, I can't even speak to that. That's so outrageous to me to, to be so negligent of your job. But my question that you haven't answered yet is why would you as the executive director take such a valuable resource instead of one of the multiple other resources you had? It, it seems like an odd choice and an odd judgment. It was because we'd already met that standard. The ACA really isn't an important standard in parole. It's not. I, yeah, I, I would beg to differ, but I, I know you would. Yeah. Yeah. But, but can you just answer the question why you chose to say center and not a legal center? Yes, and, I, and, I, and I've tried to, uh, I, I think that, uh, I think it's important to have that, well, that minimum standard. Yeah. I think she uh, holds particular expertise in that area, and I think she was a key person. And I would not have approved of it unless we could sustain the operations of the board, including hearings. Uh, that would, if I thought that that would have been impacted, I would not have approved it, neither would the chair. Okay, that's fair. Um, and so, um, why would you choose a board member with so little experience over some of the board members with so much more experience? In terms of ACA, there's no other board. In terms of ACA, in terms of the actual job of of the par of parole of their actual expertise. I'm, I'm sorry, she has decades of experience. In not on the field. parole, she does not. She has decades of experience jumping from job to job in the year. She doesn't have decades of experience in parole. So why would you? I, I'm just curious. Choose for, I'm sorry, question. choose for what? Because I don't choose for what. You just told me you chose her to go to this ACA. You I'm, didn't choose her to go? She was initially, she did this in 2017. I was the chief of field services. I had no, so who, I, had, I had nothing to do with. Oh, so you had nothing, you know. Nothing to do with her being that point person on it. I worked with her as a fellow manager. Okay. Got to know her through that process. Did her to this. It wasn't so, you, I was under the, it was you. No, it was a chairman Tressler at the time. That makes sense. Um, Okay, terrific. How would you um, how would you say her recidivism rate is? We know that she has a high parole rate. How often do those people reoffend? Because that those are the numbers. Because we haven't, you know, we used to get reports all the time. The chair used to come and report to us about individual people, but we haven't seen that. So how's her recidivism? Yep. That's the number that counts. We have statistics for the agency as a whole, but in terms of uh, individual board members, that would take uh, that would take some more work to, to produce. Well, it's not hard, honestly, because we've always done it. It's always been done. It was the precedent. I mean, it, it's not hard to do. So you don't have any idea what her recidivism rate is? Other than what we report annually. Uh, what, you rep what, what you just said to me is you only do it as a group. You're not doing individual. No, we don't. We don't look at that. Why? We don't look at that because that's that's a matter of supervision when they're in the community. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put that on necessarily on, on Colette individually. The board works in panels and groups, and uh, particularly in the life sentence hearings, it's a full board decision. So I think reporting, um, reporting those statistics as a group is is the most important. Fact. So then. Okay, it, so that follows then that her individual parole rates don't matter at all, and yet you've just touted them as, as something to be proud of. I, I, I that's, it's something to opinion with. They're not mutually exclusive, so it's one or the other. So her, her individual parole rates, therefore, are you saying really don't matter? It's I'm not saying, I'm not saying that at all. That's a matter for you to determine. No, no, I'm asking you for your opinion. You're the executive director. I want you to tell me. I think it matters that people are willing to parole individuals that have shown that they're ready to live in the community and um, have a prop, some probability of living in the community without violating the law. I think that's that's a key element for any board member that they're willing to do that. Correct, but just paroling people, that's not the goal of the parole board, okay? We, we all understand that. This is not about just letting people out. This, this happened after, you know, Council Devaney has talked passionately and eloquently about this many times after the Sinelli incident. The agency was so demoralized, it was restructured to get 
that that bottom line or ceiling. They achieved it very, very successfully, albeit at great uh, pain internally and externally. But one of the big lessons from Sinelli is we don't just, the parole rate is important. The recidivism rate is more important. Okay. So if you're just saying, I'm letting you out and they're back in a week, you failed. And, but, and I'm fascinated, and, and this is not an attack, I'm very fascinated by this, because every other administration and every other board has always tracked these numbers. It's simple. This is not hard. This is not even math. This is arithmetic, okay? And I know you know the difference, but, but you've chosen, you've very specifically chosen not to. So I have to conclude that her parole rate doesn't matter. Because if her recidivism rate doesn't matter, her parole rate doesn't. Correct? I, I, that's a yes. Uh, that, that, no, that's a yes or no question. Oh, I, Do you agree? That's a yes or no question. No, I don't agree. You don't agree. So, so, so the answer is no. The answer is yeah. I, I don't agree with your 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 premise. Um, Tell me, can you can you repeat back to me my premise? That her paroling rate doesn't matter because we're not reporting her individually regarding recidivism. Okay, and so, so, okay, great, you got it, I understand. I just want to make sure we're talking the same language. Yeah. So you don't think recidivism matters? Yeah, I, 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 obviously recidivism matters, but it's, it's recidivism is com complicated in terms of when a parole board member paroles somebody, they're paroling somebody to supervision under a parole officer. My, the large majority of my time with the agency is as a field parole officer. Mm -hmm. I'm in my 32nd year with the agency. So it's turned over at that point for supervision to a parole officer. And, and that's where the rubber hits the road. And it's multifactored. It's, it has to do with personal accountability on the part of the person who's paroled. It has to do with supervision practices uh, and so forth. So to put that on an individual board member, I think would be to a greater extent unfair because we're asking them to make a decision. We're asking them to release people and then they're responsible for everything thereafter. That so is it true then that that is why the parole people on the board go to certain uh, prisons or jails and then, and then they, the same board member, to, to follow through with what you're saying with your logic, which makes a lot of sense, so then, so then the, the board member who, who goes to, um, I live in Middleton, you go to Middleton, then that board member would be, it's, it's the same. You're not sending different people to different places because then you have no coherence and no relationships with people in the prisons that actually know these prisoners. So you keep everything uniform so there's no, so, so everyone's on the same page. The schedule varies depending on how many board members that are, are on the board at a given time. Unfortunately, we've had six board members only for going on over a year now. But that's been a choice that the governor has been made. Depending on leave time for this. Say you have a full board. So, so let's just go yeah. theoretically. You have a full board and that's how it works. Yeah. You go to Middleton. You're not sending, you're not sending someone from Pittsfield to Middleton because that would be stupid. Right, that would be a waste of resources. Generally speaking, no, yeah. If there's an emergency. There are exceptions. It's not, it's not the norm. The norm, because the, because the way that it's written, and that's why we were so excited to get board member Cal course, is because we had nobody in my district. We had nobody, we had nobody. So now in set, instead of sending someone from Worcester, he does that because the state is paying for the automobiles and the gas. That's out of the taxpayer's dollar, right? So, so we know, because we can document this, we can ask for you know, these things, this is not hard to find. So we know that you're keeping it, there's no playing around with this stuff. Okay, that's good. Um, you indicated you've seen her conduct hearings. I've seen her conduct life sentence hearings. I've life sentence hearings, not regular hearings. Um, have you been with her in the institutions? I have not been with her in the institutions. Um, in your capacity as the executive director, from other staff, have you ever had any complaints about her? I have not. You've never had complaints about her from any staff? In my, I've been the executive director since the 29th, received one complaint. Oh. Okay. 
Okay, fair enough. I believe you. And um, is it unusual for the union not to send a letter of support? In the 10 years I've been here, they always have. I, I was a member of the union, and, and I'm only familiar with them sending one for autonomy. They've sent one for, for most people. Um, okay. How would you say the morale is of the agency? I think it varies. We have, uh, I, I, I think, my time with, with the agency, um, you're always going to have a group of people experience um, uh, disgruntled no matter who is in charge. And then you're going to have uh, a variation. I'd say overall it's good, but I think it took a hit with, uh, with COVID. I think in all sectors it did. We asked people um, to continue to do their job uh, without interruption during the pandemic. We were exposed to some very risky situations yeah. that job done. And I understand that. Um, that people aren't happy with that. And I also understand that people occasionally, based on personnel decisions, uh, having been a manager, that um, there are hard feelings when personnel decisions are made. So there's, I think there's always going to be um, a percentage of people that are unhappy based on decisions that, that are made. Overall, I think we have a very, I have to say, um, particularly over the last three years, that our staff, we have many, many dedicated and committed staff who have stepped up and continued to do their job under very difficult circumstances. And I'm thankful for uh, for the staff we have and for the members. Uh, again, not to say there is no improvement on my end in terms of uh, morale, because I know there are people, there obviously are people that are unhappy. Um, some people, I think, they, they're, they're not going to be pleased uh, no, no matter what I do. Um, other people have specific issues um, that they're disgruntled about. Um, it's always true. I have a master's in business and organizational development. That's, but, but there is an ebb and flow. There's, there's a, there are different parts of that. If you graph, you know, you can even get it on a graph if you want to. So you think morale is good. That's good. Um, I'm happy to hear that. Um, so, did you say you were a TPO? Oh, oh. I started out back in the day when I started, they called us junior parole officers. It's now called TPO. It's a civil service. It's a civil service. It's a civil service. It's a civil service. Yes. Which is a bad minimal. Um, great exam. Um, so, there's a lot of concern. Uh, there's one thing we call weather do. You approve that? No, I was um, I was a chief of field services when she uh, yes. she worked with Santa at Ponca DOC, and she failed the civil service exam three times. Yet she was promoted to be a deputy supervisor. To supervise people, to supervise parole officers, even though she never passed the exam and she'd never actually done their job. She never had done the job of the people she was supervising and she failed the exam three times. Now she's promoted to the chief of institutional parole. The only analogy I can make is that is like a paralegal supervising a law partner. That has, I can tell you, deeply affected people in the field um, and made people really concerned. I know you've had, I know you, I know parole in the last years has, has lost so much institutional knowledge because of decisions like this. It, it is a public safety issue and that's one of the reasons I'm concerned about this. And I know for a fact there have been many, many complaints but she's never been removed. I can speak to since I've been the executive director in late 2019, I have had no, um, no complaints lodged against uh, during that time period. Uh, I can speak to you know, as far as having worked with her is that um, 
she's worked hard to uh, make improvements in herself. She's gone back to school and gotten a master's degree in public administration. She's uh, uh, she's attended a leadership training from the national. I understand that, sir, but she never passed the exam. It's like having a paralegal supervising law partners. Do you not see anything wrong with that? Oh, I, I know many people who are not good test takers. Um, who are I'm good. not either. I'm dyslexic. Um, it's, this is there, there were accommodations for that. Yeah, e even with accommodations, some people simply are not good test takers. I've Sad. worked with people who have been managers who don't do well on tests. I understand that. And other managers in that feeling is. I'm sorry, I keep interrupting. Oh, no, no, it's We're going to have a long hearing. Yeah. Uh, and we've got another one this afternoon. So your feeling is she's just not a good test taker. I, I think you, run the rec you will go on the record today saying that your feeling about her is she's fine in the position. She's competent and does a good job. She just doesn't test well. I think am I, am I do you agree with me? Yes. Yes. As, as statement, she just doesn't test well, but she does a good job. As with all of us, we can all stand improvement. That's not, that is a given. We understand all of us, myself, very much. Um, are you aware of her miscalculations of dates and directions that have put public safety at risk? Not to mention the potential lawsuits against the state and that these are repeatedly caught by real parole officers? By people she's actually supervising. Are you aware of this? No one's has anyone ever brought that to your attention? The computations are primarily the responsibility of the institutional parole officer, but there is some um, they do confer with the management team at various times. I'm not I'm not aware of any lawsuits that um, Ms. Weatherby has exposed the agency to okay. um, due to date calculation. Get it. Have you seen the YouTube video? I, I'm not the YouTube video that she did. Did you approve it? I'm not familiar with that. The one that she talks about her 63 moving violations and she's got to she's got to be better about all the tickets she gets while she's working for the state. I'm, I'm not familiar. I, I, I you know. didn't approve it. It's I, I will just tell you. It's incredibly embarrassing, not just to the agency, but to the governor. If I were Governor Baker, I would be eclectic that someone had done this. It's, words cannot describe. I can tell you she hasn't received any any moving violations. Her. Well, she lied on her so, video. Well, that was, I, I, I think it was stated that she had moving violations. Well, she stated it. I'm not making it up. I'm, to, I'm quoting her. Yeah, I, so this is a video she did to, to Pittsburgh State. Uh, a YouTube, it's quite famous, actually. It's, it's quite a discussion in the public safety world. It's quite, you know, she's a YouTube sensation. Um, are you aware or have you ever heard that uh, the new deputy, John Spinelli, called staff aside to find out who had spoken to Jean Tracine for the article she wrote. I mean, I spoke to her. I'm on the record. You're not aware that anyone made threats, veiled threats to staff. There's no. You are not aware of any pressure to see who spoke. That is. Tristine. You're not aware of any of that. I'm not aware. Of not aware of any of that. Um, and you've stated in emails that Colette has your full support. Um, and, uh, you don't feel there's any demoralization in, in, the, in the, you know, there's a few people, as always, that might be unhappy, but you would say, as a whole, the agency is incredibly happy. It, 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 it's well functioning, there's good spirits, it's a good team. I, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know that I would use the term incredibly happy, but I think people good, good spirits. There's, there's, there's not people like their jobs overall. And there's no discontent. It's, it's, it's difficult work. There's always going to be levels of discontent. But. Of course there are. Of course there are. Um, but you don't feel that there's any political nepotism in this agency. None. And cut. In that it doesn't really matter if the person is competent. People just, 
because I'm on the record of saying this since this governor came in, and, and you can completely disagree with me because I don't work there, I, but I follow it very, very closely. Um, and, you know, I have publicly said many times because I'm passionate about this. Um, and I want it to be the best. I want victims to be safe. I want people to succeed. It's why, you know, when they put Josh Wall in charge, he instituted a step down. That's why he brought it to a baseline. We came to a baseline. Decisions were out often in 30 days. There's no reason. Uh, listen, they're not even writing their own decisions anymore. That is astounding to me. I don't, I don't even know how it's legal that you can have somebody who's not in the room write a decision about something. But I'm not the governor. The governor's made that decision. And since, since you've told me today the agency hasn't been sued for anything. Um, I wouldn't say they haven't been sued for anything. The agency's sued every day for a variety of things. Sued all the time, too. But, but there are suits and there are suits. There are, there are things that are real and there are things that are frivolous. I, and we, all, we get that. Listen, we get sued all the time, you know? Um, I, I understand that. I, I'm, not, I'm not about that. Um, but I am concerned, you know, and I've said many times that this agency has been the political, has, has been loaded with political nepotism and is the, you know, the stepchild of the public safety of, of criminal justice. I mean, it's just, you know, and we are, you're absolutely right. You know, Chairman Tressler really, I, I think is grossly negligent. I've gone on the record many times saying that. I've said it to him. I've had conversations with him since he's gone to the bench about it. Um, I think what he did was just beyond anything I, I can imagine. Um, to not care, to really not care about people who have filed and to not read the applications um, because we know there are hundreds of them and people are just languishing, waiting for this. Uh, but he admitted that, and, and that's the high lines. Um, but there's been so much institutional loss. There have been people let go who have been career people. Right before the pensions kicked in, they've been let go. Um, but back to Tressler, he didn't do the work, so this one... Uh, Ms. Maroney has had to pick up the slack. I know they're buddies. I know they all come out of the same office. And, you know, she's applied to be a judge. So now we're going to see everything's going to stop moving, right? We know that. All of a sudden, we're getting decisions when people have been waiting, you know, 11 months for a decision. Um, if your kid had been murdered and you were waiting 11 months, to me, that's unconscionable. Unconscionable. Um, but anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Kennedy. <laughs> um, just, I just have one question to follow up on that. We used to get individual parole board members' rates of parole. We got those numbers. They're not that hard to pull together. It's certainly something that's important for us to look at, because I think the majority of this council is supportive of parole. And when you just throw out a number of 60% for an agency, well, one person could be 25%. Another person could be 85%. How are we supposed to judge if we don't have those numbers? I can certainly look into that. I know prior... We've asked exactly. over the years. We used to get them on a regular basis. We don't get them anymore. You're asking me, so I'll... You know, I, I would really like to see them. I, I can I can certainly take that back, but I, I understand that hasn't been done. And so Where do you get those from? I can go back and find out. I have to talk to our research coordinator in the chair and see what. I don't we're think it's that do. hard. Yeah. It's arithmetic. It's not math. You know, I would like to see those numbers because we, we you know, it, it's not about this particular nominee that I'm talking about. Uh, she seems to have a high parole rate. I, I, I got a letter complaining that they were too high, you know? Um, but, but I don't know. We're blind. The recidivism rate we need to see. Yeah. But, but we're also just blind. We don't know because we don't have the numbers, you know? Is that a fair thing for us to ask for? Will you give a commitment that you'll get us those numbers? I'm going to 
in the final decisions are vetted through the chair and general counsel's office, but I've committed I'm taking that back and I will get you an answer on that. On the, on the, it's not a commitment to give me the numbers. <laughs> I, I don't make decisions in a vacuum. It's what we we asked before. Yeah. That's the last two chairs. Um, I just don't know why we don't get them every time there's a nominee before us. And we've asked for them over and over and over again. It, it, it makes it look like somebody's hiding something. That's what it looks like. I certainly don't have anything to hide. I'm just saying, but you know what I mean? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hurley, do you have any questions yes, for the I do. Um, I, I'm not sure, but uh, are you living in a cloud someplace? And with the agency for 32 years, ma'am. And you don't know about a lot of the things that have been brought up this morning? I don't, I, I'm telling you that I have not received complaints. Uh, I have not received any complaints. There's been no grievances against uh, the individual that uh, Councilor Duff had mentioned earlier. Do you work in the same office building? Yes. Do you engage in conversations with people? Yes. And you're telling me you don't know about any of these issues? I know that people sometimes have difficulty with management styles, sure. Yeah, but in terms of, of any sorts of complaints, I've received, when, when I talk about a complaint is serious to me or a grievance, and I would work with the, the unions. I speak on, on a regular basis with the regular basis with the field parole officers union, which also covers the institutional parole officers. And I've told them, and from time to time, there's been issues that have been discussed at labor management meetings in terms of whether they've been having problems with what a manager has done. I, I consider that discussions for labor management in terms of a complaint where somebody comes to me and says that the person has done something that's grievable, that's wrong, that needs to be addressed. I have not received that. But, but in terms of, of, of complaints, sure, we deal with that at labor management all the time. But in terms of a, an actual complaint, I have not received anything. Did you did the agency get sued within the last year and a half by someone who was let go, who alleged that she had been harassed and basically um, tortured by some of the employees there? I, I've been the executive director since late 2019. I'm not familiar with any lawsuits of that nature since, since that period. Was a legal claim filed by an attorney on behalf of someone? It, since I've been- it was a, settled. That was settled. Since I've been executive director, I'm not, I'm not aware of any- How long have you been executive director? Since late 2019. Okay. Um, because I got phone calls from people who complained that this woman who was hired um, was set up because people inside that were alleged to be associated with this nominee um, happy, and she wasn't happy because it wasn't one of their people. I, I'm not familiar with the specifics of that. Uh, it, you know, at that time, I would tell you since 2019, no. Prior to that, I was the chief of field services, so I dealt with field services issues. If there was an issue within institutional services, I would not have, have dealt with it. And without knowing more, and I certainly wouldn't want to discuss individual personnel matters for people, but uh, without knowing more in terms of who that person is that complained or if there were um some sort of action filed i imagine it would have been handled by the general counsel's office at the time well there was there was reference in one of the letters i saw that was emailed to me that someone um was improperly denied a promotion brought a legal action and that legal action was settled by the commonwealth is this this is one and the same person or i don't know they didn't mention any names okay. but i also got a phone call phone call from an employee that's petrified that this nominee is going to come back and that if there's a change in administration 
she's going to become the chair, petrified. And the woman was scared to death because she's still working there. She told me of many instances where there was harassment, there was cronyism, um, there was certainly unfair action in uh, promoting people who didn't have the basic skill set, who couldn't pass the tests. And it was on her watch. Now, I don't care about people. There's civil service, there's testing requirements. You're telling me that this agency hires people who flunk the tests and keep them there? Seriously? Are you talking again about Ms. Weatherby? I, ha I don't know who the person is. I don't know their name. Yeah. Well, this is what Councilor Duff had asked about earlier. So talking specifically about her, she would have had to have passed a test to be in the position of a transitional officer uh, with the agency. You cannot, you cannot get a job as a transitional parole officer. Managers are not subject to testing. We've had managers uh, on on the transitional services side of the house that have never taken civil services. Maybe maybe you should start having them take tests to make sure that they are competent. Would you agree with that? Having managers take tests, I'm not familiar with with um, at least within within my agency or in corrections that managers take tests. I think other positions do, supervisory positions do, but I, I'm not familiar with managers taking tests. There are certain, obviously, experience requirements and um, other things that go, I think go into that decision. Again, uh, in, in terms of that promotion, I have worked with uh, Weatherby. Um, she's worked hard. She's gone on and got her master's degree in public administration. She's taken leadership courses at the National Institute of Corrections. She was one of the people during the pandemic that uh, probably worked hardest, uh, short staffed at that time. She's got some help now, uh, but that she went into institutions and, and, and was exposed to things. So was committed to was committed to the work. Well, so I, I will say that um, in terms of the, there's in terms of uh, the test, yeah, she um, apparently had uh, failed a promotional exam for a supervisory position. And there's many people that don't well on tests. But we've had other managers within that unit that never took a civil service test at all. They might have come over from the Department of Corrections, a prior chief. Uh, so, but at least they have credentials. Yes, they have experience. They have experience in the field. Um, typically, the managers, from what I've seen, have at least ten years of ex experience in corrections and or parole. Uh, if they're hired for a manager with with uh, with the agency, I, I, I rarely would I, would I see someone without that level of, of experience being in a management position. And certainly not in my tenure. Um, we haven't we haven't had that. Whether you can provide us with all of the rates for all of the uh, parole board members, I find it hard to believe that you cannot provide us with this nominee's rates and the rates of recidivism within a week. I will, I will certainly take that back. Well, let's put it this way. If, if I don't get it and I have to vote on somebody else, I'm both no. Right. There's, and I would love, 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 love to have somebody give us a chart of the organization of the parole board and the IOSs and the IOAPs and the ABCs and the XYZs and whatever else goes with it because it is totally confusing to me. Um, you have uh, in prison parole board people or parole people, you have people who supervise parole people outside. They have all these different initials and whatever else goes with it. And nobody talks in terms of what those initials stand for, what that job description is. And um, as long as I've been here, I've heard how bad the parole board is. I can give you a presentation on it if, uh, obviously we can't do that here today, but I could. <laughs> I want somebody to give it to me in writing. Yeah. The top. 
board members. An organizational and, chart. Yeah. yeah, we have that. I can get that to you, absolutely. Amazing. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Council. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Devaney. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, I didn't ask questions of this, not, of this uh, witness because he's coming in support. If I want to know about the department, I'm going to contact, which I do, the parole department. And I don't think I should be taking up the time. My question one is to the nominee. I agree a thousand percent with my colleague, uh, Councilor Hurley. She stole my words, exactly right. But this is, let's, let's focus on the nominee. The other thing I want to say is, I have asked for just one hearing, and they voted against me. And we have to be at 12 o'clock at an assembly. Councilor. one o'clock. Councilor, so can we, can we say this comment for the appropriate time? I'm just telling you, we should Understood, be Councilor. the nominee. Okay. Understood. And I thank you for coming in. And thank you, Councilor. That's all I'm saying. Councilor Ferreira, any questions for the witness? I, I uh, was tied up in traffic, but I did listen on the way up um, uh, by video. Um, and, you know, I, I saw people cut you off a lot, to be honest with you, and I didn't. It's not my way of questioning people. I like people to give an open and honest answer and not put words in your mouth. So I uh, like, you know, for every letter we have saying that she shouldn't be reappointed, we have one or two letters saying she should be reappointed. And in your be a 32 years of education, experience, and training, how much, how much weight, if you were sitting in my seat, would you put on hearing from a parole officer or, or autonomy Coleman who wants to reappoint it or lawyers who want to reappoint it? How much weight would you put on or would you put different weight on a parole board member saying she's great as opposed to a citizen, a lawyer, or a parole officer who's worked with her for five years saying that she does a great job in institutions? I would, sir, I hope that my um, my support would, would hold some weight, although I know, you know, for many of the counselors, they're not familiar with me at all, but I would hope that it would hold some weight. But I, I do understand there's, there are opposing point of views and I know, uh, criticisms of individual board members in the board as a whole, and maybe uh, even of, of, of my work. And, and as I've said before, there's plenty of work we have to do. We're just at the beginning of, of, of relatively of, of implementing some of the reforms over the last few years, and there's plenty more to do. But I, bottom line, I, I would hope that my support would hold some weight of people that have actually done the work uh, uh, for, for a number of years, that that would hold some weight, or fellow board member like uh, like Mr. Coleman, uh, that that would hold some weight with the uh, with the council. How about uh, like this morning, I got an email from Jason Price, institutional parole officer. Familiar. Can you tell me like what exactly the uh, interconnection between the nominee and Mr. Price would have been over the years? So Mr. Price, uh, and I'm not sure his exact start date, but I know that um, he initially started out with the EGC through civil service as a transitional parole officer, and he may, may have been on during, uh, worked at, at some point in, uh, in, during Colette's tenure as the chief of transitional services. He was then, um, he was then promoted to a field parole officer position. At the time, I was the chief of field services and hired him for that. He not only had experience in parole, but he was a juvenile, uh, um, juvenile case worker for, um, for DYS prior to coming to parole. So we hired him as a field parole officer. He worked there for a couple uh, of years, and then he had taken the promotional examination for an institutional parole officer and uh, took a job at uh, CI Concord. I think that promotion occurred under the current chief, uh, Chief Weatherby, but I, I believe Jason's got at least between his DYS time and time with parole, at least 15 years of experience in, in the field. And he's a huge supporter, so she's been a consummate and diligent employee since her arrival. <coughs> One of the sentences. Um, is he, so what exactly is his job as a quote institutional parole officer? So he supervises, I believe he has two transitional parole officers uh, under his uh, supervision at this point. So he prepares uh, all cases for the parole board from MCI Concord and the Northeast Correctional Center, the Concord Farm, which is the minimum release center out there. So 
what that involves is that um, in, in each case they do uh, an assessment called the LSCMI, which they're all trained and certified in. Everybody in that uh, unit from the TPOs up to the chief are trained in the uh, level of service case management inventory, they, which involves an interview with the inmate prior to them seeing the board. They also gather all the uh, law enforcement cor uh, correctional records, such as using mental health uh, uh, evaluations that may be available for the board. And um, after their interview, they put all the materials together and present that to the board at the time of the hearing, along with um, correctional staff that may be available uh, for the hearing. I heard Councilor Duff question uh, you at some point, and she was talking about, which is, well, I'm, I'm glad that you don't make people commute and this and that. Well, that, I don't think that's true, because I've heard from parole officers that sometimes they're given assignments, well, they travel an hour and a half, two hours. Yes. For the day, and then they travel two hours back home. Is that is that correct? Yeah, we have a number of staff that have to travel quite a distance. And I would say in terms of board members, sometimes they do travel um, a great distance. I, I would say recently, you know, while we're going through the transition with new board members, we have one board member who's going to travel, and we mentioned Pittsfield earlier, that's going to travel to Pittsfield that's never been there before. I would agree with the council Duff, that's not that that's not the ideal uh, yeah. deal for at least for the board members. But in terms of parole officers, field parole officers, they're assigned a vehicle and, and they go wherever they uh, are assigned until they can get a closer assignment transfer to a closer assignment based on seniority. And of course, we're all interested in recidivism rates of the whole all of years to that, send people back to jail and get them healthy and productive members of society. Would you say that some parole officers, some parole board members go to um, prison where the population is less likely to uh, be a recidivism stat um, and it would be difficult? I'm, I'm thinking in my mind that there are so many factors that go into, um, you know, what, 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 what prison does she get sent to compared to yeah. Tony Coleman or someone else? And is there, is there more parole rate out of that institution? And what's the recidivism rate of every institution you go to? I mean, so how do you calculate that and say, oh, she's got a 59.3 and someone else got a 73.7, .7, but there are so many factors. So do you have an answer to that? Like, how do you? Yeah, I, I, I would agree with you on that. So for instance, if someone's doing hearings at Sousa Baron Alpha, which is the maximum security prison, you're dealing with people not only with serious offenses, but have uh, significant and serious adjustment issues within the Department of Corrections such that they're at that facility and you may have somebody that's at a pre-release center who has uh, completed all their programming and is transitioning to the community, may even have a job by the time that they see the global board. So obviously that individual is a much better candidate. Uh, so you, you, you look at, you know, you'd have to look at that as a, as a factor as well, yes. Uh, I'm going to ask you an open-ended question because, uh, you know, sometimes you don't, as a, as the, you know, it's not a criminal trial, you're not on a witness stand, but sometimes it, you might feel like that. <laughs> so is there anything that we haven't asked you yet that you'd like to say um, about the nominee? And again, I just don't want, if there's, if there's criticisms uh, of, of the agency that we need to work on, I need to take those back and, 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 and work on those issues, but I just wouldn't want to see that affect or impact uh, the Santa who has um, the history of uh, work in the corrections field has now been with us over six years of what I think is exceptional service to the agency and to the Commonwealth. And I don't want any issues that the agency has and, and maybe some issues that came up with people who are, are unhappy about personnel decisions that have been made in the past. Um, that that impacts. I, and I would also want to speak, and I, I do take what Councillor Early said seriously. I would not want anybody within this agency to feel the fear of retaliation if they do have a complaint. I would want that grievance brought forward so that we can deal with it directly. I do, wouldn't want this undercurrent of uh, unhappiness. It needs to be, in, in, in order to, 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 to get to the bottom of the facts. Uh, that needs to kind of needs to be put to paper to me, and I'll, I'll handle it. I, I, I do not. I would not tolerate uh, retaliation against uh, having been a union member myself. 
and having worked with the, um, the two primary units that cover unions that cover over half of our staff, I don't want anybody. And I asked them if they have complaints to bring them forward if they're on. And they stated unhappiness with various management uh, actions at various times, but without specifics, without somebody putting a pen to paper, I can't do anything about it. And if people feel um, that there's going to be retaliation, I feel badly about that because I would want to address whatever it is and not make people feel that way. But again, I don't want that to affect um, Ms. Uh, to Board Member Santa in this situation, given her years of service and what, what she's done for the agency and the Commonwealth over the last several years. And I would also add, and I think it's that, you know, we have, not only is she eminently qualified for the job, she's also a diverse candidate, which I don't think we get enough from. Her, I think, can see, and I think it's a loss for the Commonwealth. Regardless of all the other discussions about rolling rates and recidivism rates, it's a loss for all of us. All of us in this room, if he is not confirmed. So I, again, I don't want any criticism of the UC to impact. Well, I think this fine professional sitting to my I just want to say that uh, I spent 30 years as law enforcement officer, nine as chief of police, and not all my employees love me at, on any given day. So I appreciate where you're coming from. I can't believe it either. Um, but um, I appreciate your service to the Commonwealth. I appreciate you being here today. And I appreciate the fact that you offered um, when you uh, counseled earlier that you'd come back and speak to us about issues that the council may have as a whole outside of a hearing for nominees so that it doesn't get dumped on a nominee's back when we can talk to you about the pictures. Thank you. Council okay. Ferreira, how could anyone not like you? I find it hard to believe. There are a couple, very a couple of crazy people out there, you know? Yeah, that's true. Um, so I do have a few questions. Thank you for... Uh, Just gave. <laughs> thank you. Sorry, Sorry last, last, last one here. So um, in your role and your experience, what makes a good parole board? I think you, I think they have a good board. I just, and this is again, that's my opinion. And also looking at sort of the actual, I think what we're looking for is, is to make sure that we have a variety of perspectives on the board. Mm -hmm. that have minimum qualifications that are, uh, um, uh, a variety of perspectives which I do think despite criticisms we have on this board, we have a forensic psychologist, we have a defense attorney, we have a former prosecutor, we have somebody experienced in corrections, we have a board member who has many, many years, more, more years of service than to, to the agency as well. So I think those combination of perspectives and experience are important on the parole board. I do think it's important to, um, to, to, to have the behavioral health aspect of it. And, and we do now, we have, and actually I correct myself, we have two um, forensic psychologists with the board. Um, my understanding is that um, Dr. Gavin will be starting on August 22nd with us, which I think uh, that's a welcome, a welcome addition to the board. But I think, the, I still think you want to have that rounded out variety of perspectives and experiences and lengthy experience. And I think we have that. Do you, is it in your, in the practice of the board, does the board take input from the professional staff, uh, yeah. the officers, et cetera? Yes. Yes. And, and, and they'll, they'll give, and I don't know what various weight that board members get, but they do get the assessments that are, are, are done by, uh, by the staff members. I'm not sure because I typically I'm not at, at institutional sure. as far as to what extent um they're asking for that but it's not barred to have input from yeah. so there is so there's a lot of input coming from corrections no matter what no matter the board composition would that be fair to say yes. so when i look at the information to be considered in parole release decisions in the state regulations i see the ability to evaluate a risk and needs assessment ability to evaluate what's available in the community as far as work opportunities education treatment programs evaluate behavior within the while incarcerated um, to process witness statements um, and uh, to potentially seek a mental health evaluation if it's deemed necessary. So when I hear those, I hear the need for someone who's in touch with the community 
resources and programs, independent of, of this nominee. That's what I hear, is someone who's familiar with the community resources and has whatever experience they've cobbled together to be able to make those evaluations about someone's mental health, about the needs that would either make them successful or non-successful. Is that, would you say that's fair to say? I think that would be helpful. Uh, because when I hear that, I, I'm not sure some of the backgrounds we here talked about, I'm not sure that they're necessary to fill that role or not. Um, and I'll, I'll leave that there. So I just want to make, get clarity also on things we heard before to, to tie them up. So the ACA accreditation, what's the benefit to the Commonwealth to earn that accreditation? I, I think the only benefit to that is that it's, it sets at least, it's, it's a, to me, and again, I would agree with Councilor Duff on that, I wouldn't overemphasize the significance of it, but there's a minimum standard that every agency should make and, and you know, Councilor um, Ferreira was a police chief. There was standard sure. police agency. There. If I could interrupt, I'm sorry, could I interrupt you for a sec? I, and we were accredited, thank you. Um, in the public sector, I've worked in education, and I've seen the accreditation process that high schools and middle schools go through to get accredited, which sometimes is tied to funding. There's all sorts of things that are consequential about that. And in, in that process, having, having led that process, it was really about generating a process of self-reflection and continual improvement. So we're, we're taking this step back data analysis, big picture stepping back, and then we're, we're coming up with recommendations to improve and, and we're measured against some kind of matrix of, of some kind of framework of evaluation. Is that what happened essentially? Yeah, I mean, they're looking- and You don't need to go too much in depth because I know I'm sure someone yeah, will ask the nominee. I think, I think Board Member Santa could okay. um, speak better to that. Okay. Um, uh, just, and I'm not going to try, I'm going to try not to repeat what's been said. Or, along the release and revocation rates, um, why, I guess I'm going to ask you, why is there hesitation on your part? Why do you think that, fo I assume folks above you or your team, why do you think there would be any hesitation? Why wouldn't you be able to commit right now to produce that, that information? I think this, it's, it, it's from, you know, my perspective stood in terms of um, when you get into release rates for uh, board members, there's a concern with um, how that's used as some form of litmus test for whether or not they're appropriately applying for the need standard in each case. Okay. Even in the of different institutions and places, and, and also that we're, we're getting into areas. I know individual decisions, for instance, when the board issues a, a life sentence decision, their individual votes, uh, it's just it's, uh, on my release for safety purposes. Sure. So part of that plays into it, but I would want, if, if the council is saying that they've gotten that information in the past, I would want, would want to go back and look at that and, 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 and find out, okay, what, what, we, what can we do to satisfy the, the council's written so, so I'm the newest counselor. I've never seen anyone produce any kind of data like that for us. Um, and um, to me, it speaks to transparent, like as a counselor, there's two points of data I would like to see. The approval and denial rates, which all, the only thing it tells me is, I look at all the board members, is someone way off? Is someone way off? That's all I want to see. I don't want to judge them and say, how come it's 65 and not 60 or whatever. I want to say, wow, you're at 22 and everyone else is averaging 50. What's going on? Or vice versa, right? That's, so I, that's one data point I want, approval denial rates. The second data point I want is um, the revocation rates. And I want the revocation rates tied with the approval denial rates because in my mind, Revocation is really about, A, the determination initially whether they're prepared to re-enter, and B, have the conditions placed on them been placed reasonably and um, appropriately. So if I release someone, because I want my stats to look good, I want to have a high, high release rate, and I put these absurd conditions out there that create an inevitable revocation, then the number doesn't tell me anything. Do you know what I'm saying? It seems like the numbers could, that things could be hidden in the numbers. 
And then when it comes to like a panel of three, when there's a panel of three, do we have the data on each individual's vote or do we just have the panel vote? And I apologize, I know this came up, I wanna keep it straight. When there's a panel of three, do we have the individual numbers or do you have them as a department? I would think that we have the, we would be able to extract the individual on a panel, although if you have a full three member panel, you know, you may have two that vote for and one against and you could probably pass that out. Mm -hmm. Suppose, but the ultimate decision is the decision. You know that you know, decided to parole, or maybe two sit denied, and one was in favor. Yeah. Um, you know, but again, as a counselor trying to evaluate a sitting member, this is the first time I've had a sitting member for reappointment. Um, transparency is important for me. I need to be able to see what's going on. I tried to get, you know, when I try to get video of lifer hearings, I have to get a DVD. I mean, wh why? Why isn't that online? We have, we have a digitization pro, um, program that's going into effect over the course of the next year. And so the, uh, we would have a little bit easier way to, uh, to, to access that. And just... Now I want to ask you about a couple of things that came up and I know, I know you're relatively new to the role, but I want to know what's going on in the department. So the, the March 2, 2021 state auditors report, are you familiar with that? And so something that came up earlier, um, was timeliness, and timeliness seems to have been a problem for a while. And maybe it's resources, maybe it's other stuff. What do you know? What the department has done to address um, the auditor's report and its findings? And which specific finding? Uh, in terms of the uh... this is an example. So the the findings I'm looking at um, that the parole board did not conduct required risk and needs assessments within mandated timeframes. Um, and then second finding was the parole board could not provide documentation to substantiate that parolees received all required reentry forms. So in the first, in the first instance, I think, and, and I did have a lot of discussions with the actual team that came out, uh, actually didn't come out a lot of it was virtual because it was during the pandemic that mm -hmm. we, were, um, we, we were dealing with the auditor's office. So uh, in, in 55 of the 60 cases that they examined on those, um, on those reassessments they done in a timely manner. There were five cases in which the timeline, the assessments were done. Um, if you look at our response, that the assessments were done in those additional five, um, five cases, but they did not necessarily meet the timeline. So one of the things that um, that I think played into that, and, I, and, and let me just back up too, because there's two parts of in terms of assessments, and I will say, uh, there's an assessment that's done prior to a parole board hearing. We were 100%. There were no findings in terms of, of, of cases that come before the parole board prior to right. release. That's 100%. We were prepared. In other words, no one showed up and their file wasn't prepared. Yeah, unit. Right. They were 100% in terms of getting those assessments done and before the, yeah. before the parole board. It was on the field side once they would get out those reassessments and there were those five cases. Again, the assessments were done they were they were late in terms of of timelines. And one of the things that we found that's been successful in, in the past when we've had issues uh, with various things in, in, in the field is um, the field parole officer who should basically have you know um, doing their work on a on a monthly cycle um, when they get reminders within our database prior to an assessment being due it'd be more successful. What was happening in the systems, they, they were getting those reminders when it was overdue. Sure. So, uh, what we did is we worked with a, um, the vendor that, that deals with that database, not the board people, but to, to, to um, implement uh, a to-do. That took some time, believe it or not. Well, uh, I'm glad it would, you know, to me, I'm not a tech guy, you know, press a button, we can, we, we can do this. But they, they implemented that within the last uh, several months so that now, um, a parole officer in the field should be getting a notice prior to that reassessment being. Okay. And again, I would say in all 60 cases they examined, there really was a reassessment, but there was not. They, they were late in, in those five cases. And then in terms of the, uh, the documentation, so the most critical document for uh, a parole is the parole permit itself, which has the um, which has all the conditions of parole that's um, given to the uh, a parolee cannot leave an institution without their parole permit. It has to be signed off by the parole board and the superintendent or designee yeah. at the institution. So 
there was in 59 of 60 cases examined, parole permits were given to, uh, were, well, they were given in all 60, but the, as far as having that copy on the file at the time that they examined it, there was one case in, in which it was missing. And again, we had some, this was during the pandemic, we were trying to get hard copies. We had a lot of administrative staff. I don't want to make too many excuses on this. It, it should have been there. We did have an, an electronic um, indication in our database and a copy within our database that this permit was given to this individual. The other documents have varying significance that there was, you know, in terms of, 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 so I'm sorry, and just not to go too down this rabbit hole, but so are you suggesting that it was a, a technology infrastructure issue? No, not not in that particular case. I think in that, in that case. Or just in general, but yeah, you can stick. Someone didn't have a copy in that particular um, central office file. Okay, of, so like a permit uh, call issue? Permit, but they didn't have a copy of the sign permit in that central office. Is that, yeah, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. So is, are those the kind of things that the accreditation process would also reveal? Yeah, I, I don't think that's that examined. Is it in a self audit? And I'll say those, I'll say those questions. So uh, uh, clemency. So there's been two, now in seven years, there's been two commutation hearings. Um, so uh, help me understand as far as the parole board goes. I know many of my counselors agree that two is, is not enough, given there's been hundreds of applications. Who's making the decisions whether or not to grant a, a hearing or not on a petition? So, so those are made by the uh, parole board in their executive session as part of their deliberations. And it's probably the area, at least coming into the executive director's role that I probably have the least knowledge about in terms of, I, I have pretty good fundamental knowledge of all the areas that are coming into the executive director role. Sure, sure. Obviously, I hadn't, I sure. hadn't dealt with. So one of the things that, when I came into my role, um, chair at the time, who had just become the chief a few months earlier, um, got a new general counsel and myself. And one of the things she said is her priority was to get moving on. Unfortunately, there was a backlog of, as, as this body well knows, hundreds right. of clemency petitions that had not been reviewed or acted upon in a number of years. So one of the things she sat down and said, we need to address this. So this is an, I understand. So is that happening now, right now? This is in the last few months thing. This is a, a, an effort that took place, at least to my knowledge, from late 2019. Is that happening right now? There's it's been more. It's happening on a regular basis. It's familiar for July 28th. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm exactly right on that date, but by the end of the month, there's several hearings being held. And there's uh, there are others that are in the queue too. That, there are some in the queue that have been already, okay. some that are going to him that I would hope uh, would would land on your desk at some point in the future. So why was um, board member Santa chosen for the special commission on structural racism? I think because she, um, it, it, I think it's a passion of hers and, and uh, we felt that she would uh, represent the agency well uh, as, I, as I think she does. I was surprised to hear you say that you're not familiar with um, there being discomfort among staff in the department, because I received over a dozen phone calls and a bunch of anonymous letters. Um, the letters, a let, you can send a letter and hide behind it. The phone call and telling me who they are is, is something entirely different. And as someone who works at a firm that deals with employment law, like I'm hearing the trembling in these people's voices, terrified. And, and I don't, it seems like it's pervasive, that it's not, it's not any one person. And um, that really concerns me because it's difficult work to begin with. Um, and so again, you know, having worked in education as far as a public sector employee, when someone got waived because they couldn't pass the MTEL, which is the teacher test, or when someone jumped the line to become an administrator, that's the quickest way to ruin a department. You ruin the department, ruin it. Um, the video that Councillor Duff was referring to, um, I would hope the department's aware of it. And as far as complaints go, um, you know, even regarding the the issue that was brought up around the civil service exam, I'm looking at a civil service commission decision where. The person in question had failed, and the excuse was that 
or hadn't submitted things and the excuse was that the computer had froze. And the nominee t testified that yes, she was next to her and the computer froze. So this is someone who waited to the last minute to get something in when she knew how important it was because she had failed the exam. So I, I mean, I don't need to even think twice about why morale would be low if, the, if that's who's supervising the staff especially if people look around and feel like people were passed over on that. Um, I think that's a real concern. And I don't think, I know you're new in your role, relatively still relatively new, but I, I think that's a real concern. And I've heard it well before this hearing and not in connection exclusively to any one person. And I would talking. I wouldn't say that there's no discomfort because I, 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 I think there is from time to time and we do d deal with criticism of various managers. But uh, again, I, I would want if somebody has um, a, a, a substantive complaint issue, you would want that put in writing and, and agree so that we could deal with it appropriately. And, uh, and this is the last thing that, like, to, to me. Yeah, no, the rumors don't help, right? And again, that's why the culture is so important. And I'll just, I'll just, you know, leave with this. It sounds like there needs to be some kind of safe space for people to voice themselves because they are, fear, they are fearful of retaliation. And they feel, whether justified or not, they feel they've seen it. They feel they've seen it as well. And what kind of concerns me, and it's not on you, is your hesitation to commit to bring us the data. I don't think, I'm not putting that on you. To me, that speaks with a culture where it's like very guarded and very top heavy. And I just think, you know, I doubt that's what the governor wants overall. Um, and I'm not putting that on you again, but it just seems to me the culture of the department is creating problems. And, and I don't think it's serving the Commonwealth as well as it could. I very much appreciate you putting up with all this questioning this morning. Um, and thank you very much for being here. I know you're committed to the work and that um, you're committed to making the department the best that it can be. Thank you. Council. Council to the end. Uh, at the point of privilege. Yes. Personal privilege. Um, the purpose of a witness who the nominee brings in is to talk in support. This witness has been questioned an hour and 25 minutes. I suggest that we have a public meeting and invite the public with the administrators of the parole board to talk about the administration and the deficiencies that have been brought up by Councilor Hurley and, 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 and Councilor Dub. I mean, I think this is not, this is a hearing for someone for reappointment. We have a many people who have sent letters, people who want to talk in opposition. I have put a motion that we only have one hearing. Seven one, I lost. I had a one o'clock hearing that I'm presiding. But this was squeezed in, and we have asked this man a hundred, an hour and 25 minutes. He is not the nominee. I think it's important to talk about the history and the deficiencies of the agency, but this is not where it is. So let's Counselor, schedule a public I thought you would appreciate the like ability for us to ask questions that we wanted to. Well, this is I, I got to tell you, Councillor, I'm not going to apologize for asking questions of the witness. The, the public expects me to do that. Um, but your input is noted. Success now for the uh, assembly. I think it's the LG ready. The governor comes in at 12 o'clock every week for an assembly and, and look at it. We haven't even. It's going to recess for five minutes.
Cheers.